Hello, and welcome to our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment teleconference, Only One Chance, How Contaminants in Our Environment Impair Brain Development, with guest presenter Dr. Philippe Granjon. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. Che Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find more information on the following websites, akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. Everyone who signed up for the call should have received an email from me yesterday with a link to today's presentation slides. If you don't have that link in front of you, you can access the PDF on our homepage at akaction.org. Just click on the announcement for today's call, which will bring you to the call webpage. Towards the top of the page, there's a link that says presentation. The call will last one hour with some time at the end for questions. We hope to have five to 10 minutes at the end for your questions. Before introducing Dr. Granjan, I want to say that we are truly honored that he accepted our invitation to speak with us today. His work and that of his colleagues is critical in building the scientific evidence that will convince our leaders that our current system is broken and that we simply cannot continue to allow industrial chemicals to be used without any significant testing for safety when we know that early exposure to certain chemicals damages children's brains and we suspect that many other chemicals are similarly harmful. Here at Alaska Community Action on Toxics, we're actively working to address the problem of neurodevelopmental toxicants through state legislation in a new Toxic-Free Children's Act, which we hope will be introduced soon. The proposed legislation addresses 10 toxic flame retardant chemicals. We are also working for much needed reform of the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA, our federal chemicals policy. And on the international level, ACAT is working for global elimination of chemicals that disproportionately affect peoples of the Arctic. These include pentachlorophenol, deca BDE, which is a flame retardant, and short chained chlorinated paraffins. If you'd like more information about our work or would like to get involved, we invite you to contact us and join in our efforts. And now it is my honor to welcome and introduce Dr. Philippe Granjon. Dr. Granjon is chair of the Environmental Medicine Research Unit at the University of Southern Denmark and adjunct professor of environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health. He was born in Denmark and graduated as an MD from the University of Copenhagen at age 23. Six years later, he defended his doctoral thesis on widening perspectives of lead toxicity. And since, he has devoted his career to studying how environmental chemicals affect children and their brain development. His research has been supported by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the European Commission, and the Danish Research Councils. He is the toxicology advisor to the Danish National Board of Health and has served in this function for over 30 years. Dr. Granjan has published over 500 scientific papers and is author of Only One Chance, How Environmental Pollution Impairs Brain Development and How to Protect the Brains of the Next Generation, which was published by Oxford University Press in May of 2013. He also has a website, Chemical Brain Drain, which I recommend you check out at braindrain.dk. I'm sure he'll be giving you more information about that. And Dr. Granjan lives in Copenhagen, Denmark, and in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and travels widely to study environmental problems and to examine children whose lives have been affected by pollution. Welcome, Dr. Granjan. You may go ahead and begin. Thanks very much, Diana. I'm very pleased to uh, be with you and, and uh, your, your colleagues uh, today. I very much appreciate what you guys do because uh, uh, we, we can publish research papers uh, by the hundreds and uh, they may not result in uh, any changes in society unless uh, somebody out there like you to help translate that uh, research into uh, action in society uh, to uh, make the environment safer and uh, to prevent uh, toxic exposures, uh, especially to the next generation. So um, my, my reason for uh, agreeing to uh, uh, speak with you today is that I feel very strongly uh, about two things. Um, number one, I feel that um, I believe that the brain is a crucial organ uh, for you know our lives, our livelihood, our the quality of life, and for society, and um, it, we need to protect the development of brains because we need the best possible brain power in the future 
if, if for nothing else, and to make sure that the smartest solutions are found to clean up after us, because God knows we have made a lot of mistakes, and uh, we need the best and smartest brains uh, to find solutions for the future. The, the other issue is that I think that we know enough about this so that uh, we can protect the brains better uh, and we're ready to um, initiate that action. And this is what I'm going to uh, tell you about. So my, my, uh, I have five central messages that I'll uh, briefly uh, mention here to begin with uh, so that you know what this is all going to be about. Uh, the first one is, of course, that the development of the human brain is exceedingly vulnerable to toxic chemicals. Um, and, and we have totally misunderstood for decades what's going on because we thought that when something like lead could damage brain development in children, it was because lead was particularly toxic to that particular uh, part of our physiology. No, that is a misunderstanding. The reason that lead could cause all that damage is that the brain is exceedingly sensitive to toxic chemicals. So it's a property of brain development. And that means that there's a whole lot of other chemicals that can or may affect uh, brain development in humans that may be just as bad as lead is. So that's the first uh, uh, issue I, I will raise. The next one is that uh, the consequences of what I call chemical brain drain are very serious and have been underestimated. Uh, it's not just a matter of medical diagnosis like uh, we, we looked at in the past. This is about uh, the functioning of a brain where we need every single bit of function uh, to, to uh, b become what our parents wanted us to be and, and so that we express all of those talents uh, that they wanted us to have and, and enjoy life to uh, the fullest extent and contribute to society. So those consequences have been underestimated. The, the third issue is that um, the number of chemicals uh, that cause these effects is increasing. We are finding new documentation uh, every day almost. Uh, and I'm trying to keep track of this, and I'll, I'll show you some of the um, uh, findings uh, that, that we have made. Um, the, the fourth issue is that uh, the cost to society uh, are a matter of billions of dollars every year. These are very, very sizable, and they have been totally ignored. Uh, so uh, here comes the last issue, and that is we can act. We have the, the methods, we have the means, we have uh, the, the insight, and we can do something about it. And, and so th this is something I feel very strongly about, as you can, you can understand. And so let me just walk you through um, these five conclusions and tell you a little bit about the background. And as Diana said, otherwise, there's this book that, that uh, it, Actually, it took me 10 years to put together, so, so it's available. Uh, and um, Anyway, it's easy to find on the Internet. So I uh, sent some slides, and you can download those. If you're looking at those slides, uh, I'm now moving to uh, the second one, uh, and that illustrates uh, the uh, investment of society, which has to do with the brain uh, development, the development of talents uh, in children, we put uh, a lot of societal resources into education. And if students flunk, uh, we of course blame the students, but we also tend to blame the teachers and we blame the schools uh, or the universities even uh, if uh, performance uh, is not as uh, we expect. But there's something else to blame too, and I'll, I'll come back to that. You already know what it is, the chemical brain drainers. But, but our investment in education in society has been totally blind to uh, uh, these chemicals. In fact, uh, some of them are actually 
uh, present in schools and, and school children, uh, students, are being exposed, for example, to PCBs in the uh, learning uh, uh, institutions, which I think is rather uh, ironic. So let me move to slide three. Um, we have made some very costly errors in the past. We, we have been very optimistic about uh, how the uh, the, the first uh, a very serious error is that the placenta protects a fetus uh, so well. Uh, we, we thought that it was an armor. That was what I was taught in medical school, albeit in Copenhagen. But uh, my, my teachers were uh, quite smart, I would say. I, I, I'm very happy about the education I got, except that the teachers knew very little about uh, environmental chemicals. So we thought that the placenta would protect the fetus and the fact of the matter is that it's more like a sieve. Environmental chem chemicals will uh, pass the placenta. They will m make it to the fetal circulation. They will make it to the fetal brain. So what the mother is exposed to, she will share with her child. Uh, the second error we made was uh, in risk assessment that we thought, oh, but of course children are much smaller, so uh, the dose should just be uh, taking into account in regard to the body weight. So obviously uh, exposure limits should be based on um, kilograms of body weight. So uh, acceptable exposures would be lower for children and that will be it. That's not good enough. Uh, it, an organism under development is much more vulnerable to toxic chemicals, not just uh, as a matter of a lower body weight, but simply because all of those developmental processes are extremely vulnerable. We, we also thought that uh, poisonings would be reversible just like infectious diseases are reversible, but that is not true with uh, effects that happen during brain development. If brain cells are not generated at the right time, if they don't end up in the right spots uh, where they were meant to be, and if they don't send out the right projection so that they communicate with other brain cells and, and thereby establish uh, crucial functions, then you don't get a second chance to do that. Um, so these effects are not um, reversible. They are permanent. Uh, and as I say, you only get one chance to develop a brain. And, and you're stuck with that brain the rest of your life. And, and that's why it's so crucial to um, uh, protect brain development. A fourth error that we've, we have made is that, uh, and, and I see it all the time, I work with, with uh, expert committees, for example, under the European Commission, and, and my, excuse me for saying so, but my old-fashioned colleagues uh, would say, but you know, we can't demand this uh, kind of uh, safety con control unless we have proof that uh, mercury or uh, PCB or solvents, whatever they are, uh, that they are really causing damage. <laughs> and I'm saying, you, you know, how much how much proof do you want? Um, because if if we really want a final proof, that's going to cost a lot of brains out there. And, and I think that, you, you know, if, if you believe in prevention, that's exactly what you want to prevent from happening. So the, the final error that uh, we've made is that uh, testing for these kinds of effects is simply too expensive and, and therefore we can't do it. And, and so we better, you know, cross our fingers that uh, uh, the chemical exposures are safe and nothing will happen to uh, developing brains. And that's just naive. Testing can be done. It's not too expensive, but there are certainly um, people in the private sector, people with vested interests of various kinds who would say, oh, this is very costly to me. Well, you know, it, it, there will definitely be somebody who would, would have to uh, foot the bill for developing safe alternatives. But, the, but if we don't want to do that, then the result is that somebody else will pay that price, uh, namely the next generation in regard to their brain development. Let me just go uh, very quickly through the neuroscience on, the, on slide number four. 
um, why brain development is, is so sensitive. And uh, first of all, it, it is an incredible uh, feat that we are capable of developing uh, the brain we have. Our brain is not the largest in the animal kingdom, but it is the most complicated, and it's the one that uh, fits in um, uh, functions, very complicated functions in, in the least space. Uh, if we had an, a brain organization like uh, a gorilla, say, our brains would have to be much larger than they are. But, but the way that evolution has, uh, uh, has helped us, uh, we are fortunate in having uh, brains that are extremely efficient uh, given the uh, the space and the number of cells that are available uh, for our brain functions, so at at the peak uh, of uh, cell formation, uh, every second we generate 200 new nerve cells, and those cells have to uh, uh, decide whether they want to become um, a particular types of neurons or if they want to become uh, support cells of various kinds, at glia cells. And, and in fact, you know, the brain starts uh, out as a little lump of cells that uh, uh, develop a little bit like, um, like a sausage. And, and, you know, the brain is not uh, something that sits in the middle of our body like a big sausage. Um, it, it's actually a very complex structure where most of the cells are actually in the cortex. So, and in order to generate that uh, structure, some of the cells have to migrate uh, uh, as much as a centimeter or two, which is an enormous distance for a tiny little cell. They have to find their own way and, and figure out how to get to where uh, they were meant to be and meet up with uh, some partners with, with uh, which uh, this particular cell will interact and, and help integrate the functions uh, that we will need later on in life. And, and that is an incredible feat. Then they send out axons, those um, uh, long extensions uh, that have to go all the way down to the big toe and, and uh, all the way out to our pinky finger. And, and the, if you take all of those uh, uh, nerve threads and place them lengthwise, then uh, in the end, you will uh, be able to reach something like four times around the globe, all of the axons that you have in your body. So, so <laughs> all of those connections are, uh, represent a very, very sophisticated network. And then in addition to sending out those uh, axons, um, each cell has about... Um, has about a thousand or two thousand contact points called uh, synapses, and um, during the peak of development, then each second, uh, the brain will develop one thousand new contacts. So, in in fact, just after birth, there's a lot of contacts that are quite meaningless, and and you know, um, infants uh, will, will sort of move away, move, move around in a haphazard way, and and uh, it's simply because the, the um, uh, synapses, those connections, have not been fine-tuned. That happens over uh, the next year or two. Uh, the, the child becomes capable of crawling and standing upright, etc. And, and so you also need to weed out uh, those synapses that you don't need. So all of those processes here are very, very sensitive to um, environmental chemicals. So the neuroscience insight can be translated into an, a, a very important perspective in chemical toxicology. And as I said, if, if something here goes wrong, that's just too bad. You, you don't get a second chance to go back and, and sort of uh, redo it. That there is some compensation capacity in the brain, but for that compensation to work, you've got to have the cells available in the right places with the right connections. Then you can do some uh, compensation if something else is not working properly. But it does rely on um, at least the, the majority of the brain uh, functioning uh, in accordance with the original design. Let, 
let me move to slide five to uh, illustrate to you that brain development uh, can go astray. And we first discovered that uh, very dramatically in Japan, in, um, in Minamata, the fishing village of Minamata, because it was a chemical company that released uh, actually uh, methylmercury to the bay and it uh, accumulated in the fish. Uh, nobody knew it. Uh, one couldn't taste it. The fish looked fine. Uh, but um, mothers would, uh, who ate the fish, they would escape uh, unscathed if they were lucky. But if they were pregnant, they would pass enough uh, methylmercury onto the fetus. And you see that terrible picture of a mother with her daughter uh, uh, who, who died a few years later. Uh, and the insight uh, that was expressed by this this uh, Japanese physician was that, uh, as he said, in every case a mother was healthy, and it was not until more than three months after birth that the symptoms were recognized. So in the beginning, they thought the children were just a little slow, but, but then it turned out as the brain further matured, there wasn't enough uh, brain substance for the child to develop normally. Now, all of this happened way before what, what we call the uh, Barker, or some people call the, the uh, Barker hypothesis, that um, our prenatal development is very important to our adult functioning and our disease risks uh, as adults. Uh, but in environmental health, um, we actually knew that already in the 1950s, uh, way before uh, our colleagues from uh, cardiology and internal medicine, b before they realized it. And, and let me show you some of that very dramatic documentation on slide six. Uh, it it um, comes from the neuropathologists in uh, Japan who looked at the brain structure in people who died from methylmercury poisoning. And, and at the very top, you see a brain, uh, uh, an, an adult brain, and the little dots uh, indicate the areas where there is damage uh, to the brain substance that you can see in the microphone, uh, mic <laughs> in the microscope. And, um, and, and in the adult, uh, you see that, that structure on the lower left, uh, that's the cerebellum. And the far left, that's the visual cortex. Uh, and, and on the top, it's a motor cortex. And, and this, uh, uh, this is very much in agreement with adults having problems with coordination of their movements and also having a, a very narrow visual field. They actually have, have um, a field like they were looking in a, uh, in, in a uh, theater glass. Uh, so uh, those were the main symptoms that adults would have. Now, if a child got poisoned, uh, you see a more widespread damage. And if the damage happened prenatally, and that's a bottom uh, brain structure, you see that the damage is all over. And we see uh, clinically that uh, those patients who got poisoned before they were born, uh, they have uh, all sorts of terrible symptoms and dysfunctions. And the irony is that they were exposed to uh, methylmercury doses that were much, much lower than the doses that caused much less damage in the adults. So to illustrate the, the scale of, of damage that uh, can result from uh, chemical brain drainers, uh, I want to show you slide seven. Um, which I've taken from um, Jessica Ray's work. Uh, she looked at the school uh, data from uh, Massachusetts for, from uh, uh, the 351 school districts uh, here in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And she then linked um, the Massachusetts uh, a standardized math test that, that's given to all students in, in the fourth grade. She looked at those results uh, and compared them to the average blood lead concentration uh, in the uh, school kids um, from the very same uh, municipality, from the same uh, school district. And what I've illustrated on this slide is, is that it, you, you, you can see 
um, the blue dots as some association that uh, in 19, children born in 1992 and, and therefore were um, they passed that test about 2002. Um, you see there's some association that the kids with a lower uh, lead exposure before they entered school, they also had a higher percentage of correct responses on the math test. Uh, and if you then look at the, the red dots, those are from kids born in uh, 1999. And, and so these are the, the test results from about 2009, um, it, it's the same uh, tendency. And, and if you add them together, you can see a, a very clear picture that um, the lead exposures that uh, are prevalent in, in this state, uh, just like uh, all other states of, uh, uh, of this country, uh, and actually prevalent uh, all over the world, you can see that they are in fact associated with how well the kids do on, uh, in this case, it's a standardized math test. And, and there's a lot of additional uh, information, uh, of, uh, in particular from the United States, because there are mandatory um, blood lab testing in um, uh, preschool years. Uh, and, and in uh, some states, that information has become available to researchers so that they could see uh, what the association was with the uh, school performance records. There are also data to show that um, kids who get expelled from school be because of their misbehavior, they also tend to have higher uh, preschool uh, lead exposures. Uh, in fact, when, when you try to uh, figure out what contributes to all of this, then um, before lead was brought in as, as an explanatory factor, uh, a lot of evidence suggested that uh, uh, ethnicity uh, and poverty would contribute a lot. But, but once you add lead exposure uh, to the uh, list of explanatory variables, it turns out that lead explains a lot more than those other factors do. And, and the uh, reason is, of course, that people um, who belong to minorities and, and who are poor, they tend to live in, in more contaminated uh, neighborhoods. Anyway, you, you can see from the slide that um, lead exposure is certainly affecting uh, our population today. Let me move on to uh, uh, slide eight. Um, I've mentioned lead, I've mentioned methylmercury, and uh, when Phil Landrigan and I wrote a, an article for The Lancet uh, in uh, 2006, um, we, we looked carefully at the evidence and, and we believed that there were five environmental chemicals plus ethanol uh, that could be called chemical brain drainers. Uh, the others are uh, toluene, arsenic, and PCBs. But when we returned to that um, issue six years later, uh, I'm sorry, eight years later, we added fluoride, manganese, uh, another solvent, um, perchloroethylene, uh, two pesticides, chlorpyrifos, uh, which is one of the most common pesticides used in the world uh, today, uh, DDT, and the brominated uh, flame retardants. So it, I've added a little asterisk um, to indicate that um, most of those substances are in fact also recognized as endocrine disruptors. Now, the, the way that we found out about these chemical brain drainers uh, is illustrated on the next slide, number nine, the, the time sequence. Um, because the, in the beginning, we, in most cases, found out about neurotoxicity in adults um, primarily because of occupational health data, but, but also uh, clinical uh, documentation, you, you know, from suicidal attempts or uh, accidents or various chemical explosions, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so uh, we realized um, uh, in many of these cases that the substances could enter the brain and damage the brain cells simply from that kind of observational studies. Uh, which is, of course, not very systematic, but, but 
it does illustrate that there could be a risk here. So with time, um, uh, researchers began to look at um, birth cohorts and, and document the children's exposure from, uh, let's say, blood samples from the pregnant mother or blood samples from uh, the cord at the time of childbirth, uh, and then relate that to uh, the, the uh, children's uh, neurodevelopment later on. And, and that evidence uh, added to a concern that, hey, this is probably a much, much bigger problem than just um, a small uh, population of workers in particular trades that uh, may be exposed to this uh, solvent or that pesticide. That this is probably a much, much bigger problem with um, perhaps millions of people, uh, that is children, being exposed before they are born because of environmental releases of, of these chemicals so that they occur in as food contaminants or in our drinking water uh, or in air pollution. And as you can see, this, the um, vertical scale on the, on the left indicates that uh, with time, we realize that the number of people involved in, in this, uh, what I call a pandemic, it, it's a global uh, epidemic that affects uh, populations around the world. That number is increasing steeply uh, uh, with time as we realize what is really going on. And uh, the right-hand scale is an inverted scale because we realize that the damage is happening at much lower doses than those that cause the uh, poisonings in uh, the worker populations. So if you turn to, to the next slide, uh, it, it's sort of a stylized uh, iceberg. Uh, and um, at the tip of that iceberg, those are the, currently it, it's 12. And if you add uh, dioxin, it's uh, 13. If you consider air pollution, uh, uh, one, uh, cause of uh, brain drain that, uh, that's 14. So um, we, we have more than 10 known exposures that can cause developmental neurotoxicity in humans, and that's the tip of the iceberg. We also know that a lot of industrial chemicals can reach the brain and cause toxicity uh, to the brain in adults, and, and that number uh, is currently 214. So I think that every single one of them is a risk to brain development as well. Because if, if the substances can pass the placenta, and they can, they if they can uh, pass the blood-brain barrier, and we know that from the poisoning events uh, regarding adults, then they can also pass the blood-brain barrier, which is immature, in the fetus. And if they're toxic to nerve cells, they are even more toxic to nerve cells under development. So um, in addition to those compounds, we have some experimental animal uh, literature, the, the uh, testing um, procedures that have been done around the world. And there are probably more than a thousand uh, chemicals uh, that are toxic to rats, mice, uh, rabbits, guinea pigs, etc. And we need to look at that literature as well. There is a big literature, and that has not been utilized at all. I, I understand that EPA is currently doing that, and, and I think that uh, there is about 100 or at least 100 substances that are neurotoxic uh, to brain development in uh, two species, at least two species. So uh, I would think that that um, uh, there's a hundred or more chemicals that uh, are already known about from the toxicology literature that we ought to uh, regulate. Now, the question is, can we really afford that? Well, um, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Jim Heckman, uh, who's an economist, um, he developed that uh, figure that, that is my slide number 11. And according to his research, um, you get um, more dollars back from the, your investment if you invest it early in a child's life. Uh, so what he's saying is that 
uh, programs that are targeted toward uh, safeguarding and uh, stimulating brain development in early life, uh, even before the, the current um, uh, preschool programs, um, he says you get an even greater uh, return when you test those uh, kids later they will, will show uh, a, a substantial benefit. And I've added uh, uh, in red ink uh, my suggestion that if, if in addition to what he's saying, uh, if we invest in protecting brains against uh, chemical brain drainers, it may be the best investment ever that we could make in society. So turning to, to uh, slide 12, um, I want to emphasize that the brain differs from all other organs. Uh, you can donate a kidney if you want, and, and with your remaining kidney, you can have a healthy and, and happy life, uh, being even more happy that you've helped the relative who needed that kidney. Uh, but with the brain, we need the full integrity of the organ in order to have optimal brain functions. And so we can't just um, expend part of our brain capacity and believe that we, we will be healthy and happy uh, afterwards. There's no way. In contrast, we need to protect uh, brain development to secure that we have all those brain cells available in the right places and with the right connections, because otherwise uh, we, will, we will suffer. And uh, it, 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 it's not just a matter of the Massachusetts math test. This, this is also in regard to a host of other types of brain functionings and also behavior. And it, it's more than just a matter of a medical diagnosis. Um, we don't know the exact reasons why ADHD and autism and autism spectrum disorders, we don't know why they are increasing, but, but they clearly are. And I think that environmental chemicals are very likely contributors. So the bottom line of this is that uh, the brain is crucial to our livelihoods, and the brain is really what's making us who we are. That's why we need to protect it. So what can we do about it? Well, that's slide 13. There's a couple of things that, that we, we can do right away. And, and I always stress that there is something that uh, mothers and consumers can do. Uh, unfortunately, we can't, as individuals, uh, protect ourselves and the next generation as much as we would like to, simply because those chemicals are uh, not labeled. They're not identified. They don't taste like anything. You can't see them. You have them in your body without knowing them. Uh, and so the choices that we can make are limited, but um, at least we can say we don't want furniture with uh, framework titans. We don't want our uh, rugs uh, treated with uh, uh, chemicals to prevent staining. Um, we can buy organic food uh, and we can avoid using uh, solvents uh, uh, at home or, or at least uh, air out if solvents have to be used uh, and, and prevent uh, um, pregnant women and children to come near those fumes. So, so there are things we can do. Something we can also do is to start testing chemicals uh, for this kind of property. And there is an OECD test protocol available. Uh, it has recently been approved by um, the European Chemicals Agency so that it is ready once the legislators in Europe uh, uh, decide that this test protocol should be used to um, identify uh, new toxicants, it's ready. And uh, there are colleagues um, in, in this country, uh, at, primarily at uh, Johns Hopkins, but also at European institutions that are working on cell-based tes tests where they have stem cells, neuronal stem cells, and, and other types of cells in culture. And uh, they have a battery of tests that they use to figure out if a chemical is uh, safe to developing brains or not. So um, it, 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 we have those means, and they are ready to be applied. Uh, so we need to update 
our chemicals legislation. I, I'm not going to say anything about the Toxic Substances Control Act because I think it is a serious disgrace to uh, uh, this great country that our chemicals legislation is so terribly outdated and, and actually it's almost criminal uh, the way that we allow society to expose pregnant women and the next generation's brains to chemicals that are not tested. And even if they're tested, they're not regulated to protect developing brains. So uh, I would say we need to focus on protecting this crucial organ as a main priority of future chemical legislation. And uh, the, the bottom line here is that uh, this has to happen internationally. And what Phil Landrigan and I were proposing and, and what we're trying to generate is an international clearinghouse or documentation center that can inspire more research in, in this field, coordinate uh, uh, research and um, evaluate the evidence uh, and inspire legislation uh, so that we can protect the next generation better. So my final slide uh, illustrates uh, the, um, uh, the, the the problem. You, you can see it's very similar to um, uh, slide number number two that I showed you in the very beginning. You see that funnel with the education uh, coming uh, into the uh, child's brain, and then there is this. Um, a drain of uh, brain power that is uh, leaving through that faucet uh, on the right-hand side. Um, I, I have this uh, a website where I try to digest and share information in this field, and and my um, uh, colleagues have helped me developing a. Uh, Facebook page and and even on Twitter. So I'm, I'm doing my best to to share uh, the new insights, uh, um, what I find in the scientific literature, what, what we learn ourselves from uh, our own studies and from what we read and what what we observe. And um, if 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 you want to contribute uh, uh, by you know you can upload comments and uh, you can use the uh, uh, hashtag uh, a chemical brain drain on Facebook if you want or Twitter, uh, then I, I would certainly welcome this because we need um, more communication. We need to share this information uh, and we need to uh, stimulate and inspire uh, more research and more decision making and also uh, more enthusiasm uh, about uh, protecting what I think is the most crucial resource for society, namely the brains of the future. That was my introduction to uh, to the discussion, and I hope I have shared with you um, uh, my my own um, enthusiasm and um, uh, also worries uh, why we need to do something in this particular field. Uh, and I would very much welcome your comments and, and questions. So. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, wonderful, Dr. Grajan. Thank you so much. Um, this is the portion of the call when we invite questions and comments from participants. We have about 10 minutes to do so. So if, you have, if you'd like to ask a question um, or make a comment, please press star 2 to unmute your line. Please also state your name and affiliation. It's good just to know who's, ca who's calling, wh where the question is coming from. And we ask that you try to be brief, um, just so we can get to a number of questions before we're out of time. So thank you. Good Hi, morning. My name is Jessica Bye. Winstopper with Chicklin Native Village. And um, thank you very much for this overview. I, I wish um, we had the opportunity to listen to you a lot more and learn a lot more. But thanks for this introduction. One question I have is on your slide seven about the Massachusetts um, mass scores um, in relationship to the blood lead um, quantities at preschool age. Why was there such a dramatic difference between the 1992 born and 1999 born students um, in their lead quantities? What, what was the environmental factor that made um, the pink dots all on one side and the blue dots all on another side. 
Okay, um, let, let me answer this very quickly. Um, uh, th this is Jessica Rye's work, uh, who's a uh, uh, social scientist. Uh, and, and what she did was to take the average blood lead measurements uh, after excluding the highest value. She did that for, for all, of the, all of the kids. Uh, and uh, over time, lead exposures in North America have decreased. So what you see that the, the red dots are to the left of, of the blue dots, that's simply a result of blood lead concentrations decreasing over a seven year period. This has been seen in, in um, many countries and, and also multiple states uh, here in this country. And, and so the apparent uh, effect of this is that at the same time, the percent correct answers have increased uh, toward uh, 90% or even above. Uh, and, and so this is like a, a, a side effect, if you want, of society being better at uh, controlling lead paint, uh, uh, polluted soil, uh, uh, canned food that, that used to contain lead. Uh, all of those uh, various sources are better controlled nowadays. I don't think that, I mean, you can see the exposure limit for that CDC is, has published. Uh, it's too high. It doesn't protect enough. And I think there are more gains to be made by even pushing lead exposures uh, further down below uh, one microgram per deciliter. So, um, and I think these um, uh, these numbers that Jessica Rice has um, uh, collated, I think they clearly show that. Thank you. Another another question or comment? Um, this is Vai Wahi. I'm then... a Native Village of Sivanga tribal member. I'm a mother and grandmother. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the, our uh, presenter, Dr. Grand Jean. Um, this is a very important and very interesting um, take call, and I'd like to thank you for all the information that have, you have provided us. I just have a comment. Um, as a St. Lawrence Island Yupik mother and grandmother, um, my concern and comment is that our people here in the Arctic were on the receiving end of these at these global contaminants, persistent organic pollutants. Our uh, traditional foods, our main foods, the bohe twill, walrus, and seals, are so contaminated with global contaminants at levels we should not be eating them. Uh, and this will result in a culture. Our children will not be able to pass on our, our languages, our songs, our traditions, and our culture, and our people will die off. So this, not only for indigenous people of the Arctic, but other um, um, indigenous people worldwide that uh, rely on traditional subsistence foods. Our cultures, our languages, our songs are at risk. Uh, we already have health disparities in our communities. So I'd like to urge uh, the people on the call to step forward. There's a crisis here. We need support from not only in Alaska, but the whole uh, planet as a whole to, to make changes. Um, so that our cultures and way of life and people can be um, saved. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I understand. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I have actually, I've been to Alaska a couple of times, but, but uh, I've only been peripherally involved in, in uh, research there. But I do conduct studies in Greenland, and I, and I think the circumstances are very similar in that, that there is an indigenous population uh, who suddenly realizes that their traditional way of living, uh, uh, eating seal, for example, um, is something that can't be considered safe anymore. And, and uh, when I tell them that uh, the seal is uh, full of perfluorinated compounds, they say, what? 
<laughs> what are you talking about? And I said, well, these are toxic chemicals uh, that actually, um, they don't really come from uh, your, your own society, but they, those substances move with marine currents from faraway countries uh, where they have uh, produced millions of pounds of, of, of them uh, every year and release them to the environment. And finally, they end up in the marine food chains, and that's what you're eating. I'm sorry, it's a, that's a fact of, of life. And and uh, all I can say is that we have to work together to try to create a safer world for everybody, and in particular for, for, for the next generation. And unfortunately, the, the first thing we have to do is to realize that we have a big problem in front of us. And the indigenous people in Alaska and, and Greenland and elsewhere, they are actually... Um, uh, at at the center of this particular problem, it I don't know. I find it a a huge um, matter of injustice, and I'm I'm uh, uh, desperate in regard to uh, you know what I can do myself to correct this. But but as I said, the first step is to realize that it's there, and then we have to work together to see what we can do to. Uh, find solutions. We have Thank the you. ICC Thank process you. coming up and we have a care for the U.S. Is there recommendations that we should be promoting this process as we go forward? Um, I, your question was difficult for me to understand, so perhaps Dr. Ganjan didn't hear it either. Can yeah, you, do um, we uh, have a process that we can promote forward in the ICC process with the U.S. holding the chair? Uh, I'm sorry, ITT? I'm sorry, I, uh, what's that? I think it was ICC. Was it ICC? I, Inuit Circumpolar Conference? Is that what's being spoken about? Yes. Okay. okay. The ICC, Dr. Granjan, are you familiar with Inuit uh, Circumpolar oh, Conference? Oh. Uh, only peripherally, I, I work with the um, uh, AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, and, and just uh, uh, very recently I uh, reviewed a chapter that uh, colleagues from um, um, several uh, Arctic countries uh, have put together on the health risks associated with chemical exposures in the Arctic. And um, I think that chapter is still being developed, but but it should come out um, later this year, and, and I think it provides very very strong evidence that what we perceive uh, here in in the temperate zone, that like like Boston or Copenhagen, um, what we perceive as big problems, they are really really huge uh, in the Arctic, uh, and so. My my contribution. Uh, I, I'm I'm not so familiar with ICC, but but my contribution, uh, at least so far, has been mainly through AMAP, and and I think it's a great organization that helps provide the uh, scientific evidence for the Arctic Council. I had a question. Uh, Thank to, you. We can... uh, hello. Hello. I had a. Yeah, hi. I had a question. Uh, I am enthusiastic about this and have been for a while. Uh, we work a lot with pesticides here on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and there's two of them that I see a lot used that are on the list on, online, and that's glyphosate and imiclopred. And I wondered what the extent is the uh, on the uh, documentation of that being a, uh, a, a brain drain. Thank you. Uh, in, in regard to those two substances, we don't have enough evidence to say that they are definite uh, brain drainers in humans, but I, I think both of them are on the list of substances that uh, can cause neurotoxicity in adults. So that means that they can enter the brain and cause damage to brain cells. I think they're very likely also to uh, be capable of causing damage to brain development in humans. So um, <laughs> as I said before, I recommend uh, pregnant women to uh, stick to organic food if they can. And uh, I'm, I'm much aware of the use of uh, pesticides here in Massachusetts on Cape Cod and, and, uh, and elsewhere. And um, I, I understand the 
argument from uh, the the uh, farmers, uh, but uh, I would say they they should also appreciate uh, the needs to protect the brains of the next generation, and and hopefully with time they can find safer solutions without uh, uh, using Roundup and and uh, substances like that. Hello, I'm Thank you. I believe we have. Position. Time for one more question, just one more probably, so go ahead, whoever started. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just a quick question as a physician, I'm trying to decide what to do about um, the recommendation for pregnant women and uh, infants fed tap water and whether they should drink fluoridated um, tap water. Do you have any record or insight about this or thoughts about this? Okay. It, it was a little hard to hear because I, th I think you're talking from a cell phone, but, but you, you uh, ask about fluoride in drinking water, correct? Yes, for pregnant women yeah. and uh, infants being fed through form yeah. formula. I, yeah. I, I, I think in regard to fluoridated drinking water, the, the, the jury is still out. But um, what, what I believe very strongly that we have seen, be, because I've, I've studied this very uh, in, intensely myself, is that uh, elevated levels of fluoride in drinking water can cause brain drain in children. Th this has been shown um, very clearly in, in studies that uh, have been done in China. And, and in China, um, uh, it, it's, it's for, for a study of, of, of this kind, it's, it's a, a very important setting because those families, they stay in the same place. And therefore, we can, when we examine the kids at school age, we know exactly uh, where they have gotten their water from since it, before they were born. And, and therefore, it, it's uh, the studies that our Chinese colleagues have uh, carried out are, are uh, of very high quality. And, and so when we put all of this uh, evidence together, I think there were 27 different studies that we looked at. We find that there is a definitely an association, kids exposed to higher levels of fluoride in drinking water, they have uh, lower IQ levels. And so we presented this, and, and um, I've discussed this with the Centers for Disease Control, uh, and, and I think we need to uh, look at this very carefully because so many people in this country uh, get fluoride from their drinking water. And while it, it does have some uh, important effects on the teeth, what the water does is that you absorb it and then you circulate it in your whole body and it can enter your brain. And it's nothing to do in the brain. And we need it on the teeth. That's, that's where we need it. So it's really not what um, uh, President uh, Obama is talking about, uh, uh, precision medicine. Uh, as, as a new goal, and fluoridated drinking water is as far as you can get from uh, precision medicine. So I, I hope that the, the CDC is listening in and that they, they will um, uh, initiate research in this field so that we can make sure how much fluoride can we really tolerate and, and how much can, uh, in particular, developing brains uh, tolerate so that we can protect the next generation better also against this substance. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry. Can we I uh, get in one more question? comment? Oh, make it brief. Yes, you may. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is Ali Hamadi from the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Uh, we work on some topics related to traditional foods. And I just uh, would like to make this comment that we should really not discount the benefits of traditional foods, fish and seal and marine mammals, because there have been many established uh, uh, good health effects resulting from eating those foods. And they're not just health effects, they're they're also traditional, uh, religious, and cultural that are so important to uh, uh, the traditions that uh, Ms. Swaggy was talking about. And while we do need to reduce contaminants as much as we can, uh, the, there are many studies showing the abundant benefits of consuming uh, some of these foods. And that's why the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium has this uh, a big initiative called Store Outside Your Door, <clears throat> uh, encouraging consumption of these foods. I, I just wanted to uh, insert this comment so people didn't walk away thinking that uh, it was really bad to eat those foods. 
I, I appreciate that. I wholeheartedly agree with you, and, and I can tell you that uh, my, my colleagues in Greenland, uh, they have the same perspective that, that you do. We, we have to look at both sides uh, and not just the, the contaminants. But, but again, I, I still find it very unfair that a food that used to be entirely healthy that that's now being endangered the way that, that it is endangered due to our uh, irresponsive uh, use of, um, of toxic chemicals in the rest of the world. I, I agree. Reduction uh, of, of chemical concentrations in foods and other media should, should be really a, a top uh, priority. Thank you. Is it, Thank um, you. Can I get in one more? Just quick thing, Diana, this is Alexis Ross-Miller. I'm the new advocacy director for ACAT. I'm based here in Juneau in the state legislature. Yes. So please. my comment to anyone, the woman in Savunga and the woman from Chickaloon and anyone else who is an Alaskan, you should be contacting your state representatives, state legislators, writing letters, making phone calls, complaining about this issue, and more will be uh, to come from me to people that are on this call regarding what's going to happen in the state legislature and the issues that we're working on for Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Great. Thank you, Alexis. And um, that does conclude our teleconference. Um, we, we really are out of time, and I just want to – I have to make a few um, closing remarks. I did want to give you, Dr. Granjan, a chance to say anything, if, if there was anything else that you wanted to add. I, I've really enjoyed uh, being part of this uh, discussion. I think that, that the questions and comments were uh, highly relevant, and, and I'm uh, proud of being uh, part of, of a group with you, uh, with uh, you know, with whom I, I share uh, the same enthusiasm. So if, if we should work together, like uh, some of the last comments also suggested. We should work together be, because we have goals in common that are very, very important. Absolutely, and, and thank you, because we are all working on a different aspect that needs the other, the other input to, to, to um, tell the full story. So thanks to everyone. Um, there will be an MP3 recording of this teleconference available on our website, and you will receive an announcement when that's ready. Our next call will be Wednesday, March 4th. The call will be on flame retardants and public health, fire safety without harm, with Dr. Arlene Bloom, and we've had her as a speaker before, um, She's really excellent, and um, so please sign up for that. You can register on our website. And if you have additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. The phone number is 907-222-7714. You can email me, diana, at akaction.org. And thanks again um, to everyone for calling in. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you for me, too.